Hey, what up? Welcome back. We're about to go through chapter 22, Injuries to the Muscles, Bones, and Joints. Let's get started. Although musculoskeletal injuries are almost always painful, they are rarely life-threatening. However, when not recognized and taken care of properly, they can have serious consequences and even result in permanent disability or death. Broken bones, dislocated joints, strained muscles, and similar injuries are common, and most people will experience one or more of these during their lifetime. Injuries to muscles, bones, and joints range from simple minor problems such as a sprained finger to serious situations such as a fractured pelvis. In this chapter, you will learn how to recognize and care for muscle, bone, and joint injuries. Developing a better understanding of the structure and function of the body's framework will help you assess musculoskeletal injuries and give appropriate care. The musculoskeletal system is a combination of two body systems, the muscular and skeletal systems. It consists of the bones, muscles, tendons, and ligaments. The skeletal system creates a structural framework for the body and is comprised of approximately 206 bones of varying shapes and sizes. There are six sections that comprise the skeleton. The skull, spine, thorax, pelvis, upper extremities, and lower extremities. There are three types of muscles, the voluntary muscles, smooth muscles of the walls of the organs, and cardiac muscles of the heart. Voluntary muscles, also called skeletal muscles, are the major muscles that make up the body and enable movement. Ligaments and tendons join structures of the musculoskeletal system together. Ligaments hold the bones at a joint together and tendons connect muscle to bone. All joints have a normal range of movement, an area in which they can move freely without too much stress or strain. When joints are forced beyond this range, ligaments can stretch and tear. Muscles and tendons also become stretched or torn when placed under a lot of stress or work too hard. Muscles, bones, and joints are injured when force is applied to them. Knowing the specific mechanism or cause of injury can give you important clues about which parts of the body may be injured, what other hidden injuries may exist along with the more obvious ones, and how serious the injuries may be. There are three basic mechanisms of injury. Direct force causes injury at the point of impact. For example, the patient may have been hit by a loose pitch during the baseball game, fracturing the bone in the ankle. Indirect force transmits energy through the body and causes injury at some distance from the original point of impact. For example, the patient may have fallen from a galloping horse and stretched out the arms while landing so that the hands hit the ground first. The collarbone is broken when the force is transmitted up the arm to the shoulder. Twisting force or rotating force causes injury when one part of the body remains still while the rest of the body is twisted or turned away from it. For example, a patient may be skiing and fall to the side, causing a leg to twist while still in a ski boot that is pointing downhill. The four basic types of injuries to muscles, bones, and joints are fractures, dislocations, strains, and sprains. A fracture is a break or damage to a bone. Fractures can involve bones that are broken all the way through, chipped, or cracked. A fall, a blow, or sometimes even a twisting movement can cause a fracture. Some fractures are obvious, but others may not be easy to detect without an x-ray. While most isolated fractures are not considered critical or life-threatening, if the femur or pelvis is fractured, the patient is at serious risk of excessive blood loss, shock, and death. These two bones contain many blood vessels and any injury tends to cause heavy bleeding. Fracture to the spine can also result in damage to the spinal cord. There are two kinds of fractures. Closed fractures, the skin over the broken bone is still intact. And open fractures, there is an open wound in the skin over the fracture. In some cases, the broken bone actually protrudes through the skin or is visible through the wound. While closed fractures are more common, open fractures are more dangerous because they carry a risk of infection and severe bleeding. In general, fractures are life-threatening only if they involve breaks in large bones such as the femur, sever an artery, or affect breathing. Since you cannot always tell if a person has a fracture, you should consider the mechanism of injury. A fall from a height or a motor vehicle crash could signal a possible fracture. When in doubt, suspect a fracture and provide care accordingly. Dislocations are usually more obvious than fractures. A dislocation is the displacement of a bone at a joint away from its normal position. The bones in the human body are linked together at joints. When the bones that normally meet at a particular joint have been displaced or separated from each other, 
and the ligaments or tendons have been stretched, displaced, or torn, this is called a dislocation. Some joints, such as the shoulder and fingers, dislocate more easily because they are relatively exposed and not as well protected by ligaments. Other joints, such as the elbow, are less likely to become dislocated, but are just as serious as joint dislocation. In general, dislocation requires a severe force. However, if a joint has become dislocated once and the ligaments holding the bones in place were damaged, subsequent dislocations are then more likely to occur. In some cases, dislocation can become chronic so that relatively minor movement can cause joint instability. A force strong enough to cause an initial dislocation can also cause a fractured bone, bleeding, and damaged nerves, so it's important to check for those injuries as well. A dislocation can be extremely painful. A sprain is the partial or complete tearing or stretching of ligaments and other tissues at a joint. If the bones that meet at a joint are forced beyond their usual range of movement, the ligaments can be stretched or torn even though the bones are not actually dislocated. The greater number of ligaments torn, the more severe is the injury. Severe sprains caused by a great deal of force being applied can also involve fractured or dislocated bones. Milder sprains are caused when the only injury is stretched ligaments. Patients generally find that the pain of these mild sprains is quickly resolved and they return to their normal activities. However, this often leads to re-injury of the joint that was sprained. Proper care should always be given once ligaments have been stretched or torn, even if the injury is mild. Otherwise, the joint may become less stable and the partially healed less stable joint will be much more susceptible to re-injury. The joints most easily injured are at the ankle, knee, wrist, and fingers. A strain is the excessive stretching and tearing of muscles or tendons, sometimes called a pulled muscle or a tear. Tendons are stronger than muscles and more resistant to injury, so damage more often happens in muscles or at the attachment between the muscle and tendon. Strains can result from overextension, such as lifting something too heavy, or from working a muscle for too long. They can also result from sudden or uncoordinated movements. Strains most often include the muscles in the neck, back, thigh, or calf. Like sprains, strains are often neglected and this may lead to re-injury. The muscles need time and rest to repair the damage. Repeated strains of the neck and back are common causes of workers being absent from work. Injuries to the musculoskeletal system are identified during the physical examination. Because these injuries often appear to be similar, it may be difficult for you to determine exactly what type of injury has occurred. As you complete the physical examination, think about how the body normally looks and feels. Check for deformity. Compare the injured side to the uninjured side. Ask how the injury happened. The cause of the trauma may alert you to the possibility that the muscles, bones, and joints have been injured. As the patient or bystanders explain how the injury occurred, listen for clues, such as a fall from a height or a serious motor vehicle accident. Also ask the patient if any areas are painful. Then carefully examine the entire body, starting with the head. Keep in mind as you assess the patient that if there was sufficient force present to fracture a bone or dislocate a joint, that force may also cause bleeding, internal injuries, and shock. Fractures can cause severe pain, and there may be so much focus on this that the patient will not mention other problems, such as abdominal pain, which may actually indicate more serious injuries. Some common signs and symptoms associated with musculoskeletal injuries include a snapping sound. If a bone is fractured, the patient may report hearing or feeling the bone snap or break. Deformity or angulation. If you suspect injury in one arm or leg, but not the other, compare the two arms or two legs to see if the injured limb is bent at an abnormal angle or has changed in shape compared to the uninjured one. Other fractured bones may show indentations, and a dislocated joint often shows an indentation where the bones would normally meet. Pain and tenderness. The pain of a fractured bone or dislocated joint is often severe. Crepitus. There may be a grating sound or feeling when attempting to move the fractured bone, caused by the two pieces of bone rubbing against each other. Swelling may be present and may obscure some indentations. 
The patient may be unable to move the affected area due to pain or because of a dislocated joint. In an open fracture, the broken ends of the bone may be visible and protruding. Internal bleeding may cause bruising as the blood pools under the skin. There may be a loss of circulation or sensation in an extremity like the shoulders to the fingers or the hips to the toes. It is often impossible to determine whether a patient has experienced a fracture, dislocation, sprain, or strain at the initial examination. X-rays and other tests by a healthcare provider will determine the precise nature of the injuries. Fortunately, it's not necessary to know whether the swelling of an ankle, for example, is caused by a fracture or sprain to provide appropriate care. A gentle reassuring approach is important in caring for patients with muscle, bone, and joint injuries. The patient is likely to be experiencing severe pain and may be frightened. Avoid moving the injured parts of the patient's body as much as possible, as this is likely to increase the pain and may cause further injury. Keep the injured area stable in the position found until more advanced medical personnel take over. For any muscle, bone, or joint injury, follow these general guidelines when providing care. Follow standard precautions. Ensure that the patient is breathing effectively and administer emergency oxygen if needed. Control bleeding if present. If a spinal injury is suspected, stabilize the head, neck, and spine and keep the patient flat. Avoid any movements or changes in position that cause pain. The patient will usually find the most comfortable position. Keep the injured area immobile in that position. Remove any jewelry or restrictive clothing in the affected area so that swelling does not cause more pain or injury. Clean and bandage any open wounds before splinting. Follow the steps on the next pages to immobilize the injured joint or bones with splints only if you must transport the patient to definitive medical care and you can do so without causing more pain. Check for circulation and sensation to the limb. Feel for the patient's distal pulse, skin temperature, and ability to move and detect touch in the injured parts before and after splinting. Call for more advanced medical personnel if you suspect a fracture to an area other than a finger or a toe, the injury involves severe bleeding, the injury impairs walking or breathing, the injury involves the head, neck, or spine, or you see or suspect multiple injuries. The general care for all musculoskeletal injuries is similar. Rest, immobilize, cold, and elevate, or RICE. Another common interpretation of the acronym RICE is known as rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Rest means avoid any movements or activities that cause pain. Help the patient find the most comfortable position. If you suspect head, neck, or spinal injuries, leave the patient lying flat. Immobilize means stabilize the injured area in the position it was found. In most cases, it will not be necessary to apply a splint. For example, the ground could provide support to an injured leg, ankle, or foot, or the patient may cradle an injured elbow or arm in a position of comfort. Cold means apply a cold pack or an ice pack for periods of 20 minutes. If 20 minutes cannot be tolerated, apply ice for periods of 10 minutes. If continued icing is needed, remove the pack for 20 minutes and then replace it. Cold helps reduce swelling and eases pain and discomfort. Commercial cold packs can be stored in a kit until ready to use, or you can make an ice pack by placing ice with water in a plastic bag and wrapping it with a towel or cloth. Place a thin layer of gauze or cloth between the source of cold and the skin to prevent injury to the skin. Do not apply an ice or cold pack directly over an open fracture because doing so would require you to put pressure on the open fracture site and could cause discomfort to the patient. Instead, place cold packs around the site. Do not apply heat as there's no evidence that applying heat helps. Elevation means elevating the injured area above the level of the heart, helping slow the flow of blood, helping to reduce swelling. Elevation is particularly effective in controlling swelling in extremity injuries. However, never attempt to elevate a seriously injured area of a limb unless it's been adequately immobilized. When an injury to bones, muscles, or joints is suspected, immobilizing the affected body part is an important step in treatment. Preventing the bones, joints, and ligaments from moving helps to reduce the risk of further injury and minimizes the risks of some possible complications, such as 
broken bone ends injuring blood vessels, nerves, or muscles as they move. This can cause loss of sensation in the affected area or increased bleeding. Broken bone ends breaking through the skin. Blood vessels being compressed by broken or dislocated bones, thus reducing blood flow. Paralysis caused by damage to the spine. The purposes of immobilizing an injury are to lessen pain, prevent further damage to soft tissues, reduce the risk of serious bleeding, reduce the possibility of loss of circulation to the injured part, and prevent closed extremity injuries from becoming open extremity injuries. A tool or device used to immobilize an injury is called a splint. There are many commercially manufactured types of splints, but if necessary, one can be improvised from items available at the scene. No matter where the splint will be applied or what the injury is, there are some general rules for splinting. Splinting should only be performed if you have to move or transport the patient to receive medical care, and you can do so without causing more pain. Assess the patient's distal pulse, skin temperature, ability to move, and ability to feel at the body part that is on the other side from the injury from the heart. For example, if the elbow has been injured, check pulse, skin temperature, mobility, and sensation at the wrist. If a leg bone is injured, check at the ankle. Continue to assess these three signs every 15 minutes after the splint has been applied. This will let you know if the splint or swelling under the splint has impaired circulation to the affected area. If a fracture is suspected, immobilize the bones or joints above and below the injury. For example, if a bone in the lower leg is broken, you would immobilize the ankle and the knee. Cut off or remove any clothing around the injury site. If the patient is wearing a watch or jewelry near the injury, these should also be removed. Swelling may occur beyond the actual injury site. If an elbow is injured, for example, any bracelets, watches, or rings on the wrist and hand should be removed. Cover any bleeding or open wounds, including open fractures, with sterile dressings and carefully bandage with minimal pressure. Do not try to push protruding bones back below the skin. Do not attempt to straighten any angulated fracture. Always splint the limb in the position found. Do not allow the patient to bear weight on an injured lower extremity. Pad the splints you are using so that they will be more comfortable and conform to the shape of the injured body part. Secure the splint in place with folded triangular bandages, roller bandages, or other wide strips of cloth. And elevate the splinted part if possible. Whether commercially made or improvised, there are six general types of splints. Soft, rigid, traction, circumferential, vacuum, and anatomic or self-splint. Soft splints include folded blankets, towels, pillows, slings, swaths, and cravats. Many improvised splints are made from soft materials such as bed pillows or blankets, and they can be effective if secured properly. A swath is a cloth wrapped around a patient to securely hold the arm against the patient's chest to add stability. Cravats are folded triangular bandages used to hold splints in place. A sling is a type of soft splint made from a triangular bandage. It can provide stability when the shoulder, elbow, or upper arm has been injured. The sling will support the weight of the arm. To immobilize the injury, you should then apply a binder, wrapping the cloth around the patient and the arm to hold the arm securely against the side of the patient's chest. With both the sling and binder in place, the arm will not be able to move, the weight of the arm will be supported, and the patient's pain should be significantly reduced. A rigid splint is one that is made of a rigid material such as wood, aluminum, plastic, cardboard, or composite materials. Some are specifically shaped to be used for a particular body part, such as the arm or a finger. Some are designed to be pliable so that they can be shaped to the body part. They may come with padding or require padding to be added at the time of use. If commercial splinting materials are not available, improvised rigid splints can be created from cardboard boxes, rolled up magazines, an athlete's shin guards, or other items available at the scene. Look for an item that is light but rigid and strong enough to resist breaking. It should be long enough to prevent movement on either side of the injury and wide enough that it will cover the entire injured area. You should also be able to pat it effectively to protect the skin and any wounds. 
A traction splint contains a mechanical device that is attached to the body part above and below the injury and provides a steady counter pull. This is not the same as applying manual traction to realign the bones, and these splints are not intended to reposition fractured bones. Instead, they reduce pain and blood loss by immobilizing bones that might otherwise move in the direction opposite to the splint's pull. Each brand or type of traction splint will have instructions about correct use. A circumferential splint surrounds or encircles the injured body part. One example is a commercial air splint, which begins as a soft, pliable splint that can be positioned around the injured area. It's then filled with air and becomes rigid and applies pressure to the injured area. Air splints have the potential to interfere with circulation, making it difficult to check the patient's pulse or temperature. They can, however, be helpful in reducing bleeding in cases of serious injury to the pelvis. Air splints should only be used under medical direction. A vacuum splint starts out soft and pliable so that it can be shaped to fit the area that has been injured. Once it's in place, the air can be sucked out, creating a vacuum inside and making the splint rigid and immobilizing. In many cases, the patient's own body can act as a splint. This is called an anatomic splint or self-splint. For example, if the right leg is broken, the left leg can be used as a splint. The legs are fastened together using cravats or roller bandages. Any gaps between the legs are filled with padding. The upper extremities are the arms and hands. The bones in the upper extremities are the collarbone, shoulder blade, humerus, radius, and ulna, as well as the bones in the hand, wrist, and fingers. The upper extremities are the most commonly injured parts of the body. Since people who are falling or about to crash instinctively try to protect themselves by throwing out their arms and hands, these areas receive the force of the impact. Often the result is a fracture, sprain, or dislocation. When the collarbone is broken, the patient's shoulder may look lower than the uninjured side. You may see obvious deformity in the collarbone. It is best splinted with a sling to reduce the pull from the arm's weight and a binder to immobilize the arm against the chest. A dislocated shoulder will appear deformed and a hollow may be visible in the upper arm below the shoulder. This injury is extremely painful. There is a risk that nerves and arteries near the shoulder can be damaged by movement, so be cautious as you apply any splints. A sling and binder should be used with some padding between the arm and chest to maintain a reasonably comfortable position. The humerus is a strong bone, so if it's broken, most often near the shoulder or partway towards the elbow. Check for other injuries, as considerable force probably was involved. This injury can be splinted with a padded rigid splint on the outside of the arm. If the elbow can be comfortably bent, you can use then a sling and binder. If the elbow cannot be bent without causing more pain, or if the rigid splint you're using is longer than the upper arm, Keep the right arm straight at the patient's side and wrap the bandages or binders around the arm and chest. Do not attempt to straighten or bend the elbow or change its position. If the elbow is bent, even if it's deformed, splint with a sling and binder. You may use a flat pillow or towel wrapped around the injured area and then secured to the chest. If the elbow is straight, use rigid splints along the length of both sides of the arm from fingertips to forearm. A rigid splint extending from the elbow to the fingertip should be applied first. Then a sling and binder can be applied to support the arm against the chest. If there's no open wound, a circumferential air splint extending from the elbow to past the fingertips can be applied instead of a rigid splinting. If a single finger has a broken bone, you may be able to create a self-splint or anatomic splint by taping the injured finger to the one beside it. A tongue depressor or similar sized piece of cardboard can also work as a rigid splint taped to the finger. When several fingers have broken bones or the back of the hand is involved in the injury, you will need to splint the entire hand. To immobilize the hand, place a small ball or a rolled up bandage or face cloth inside the palm of the person's hand with the fingers curled naturally around it. Then, wrap the entire hand and splint the lower arm and wrist with a rigid splint or arm board. A sling can be added to help support the arm. Injuries to the pelvis are potentially life-threatening because of the risk of heavy bleeding in this area. Assess the patient for shock and internal blood loss. To immobilize a pelvic fracture, a pelvic wrap can be used following the manufacturer's instructions and if you are trained to apply one. If a pelvic wrap is not available, one can be improvised using a sheet that is repeatedly 
folded lengthwise to create a thick 8 inch wide strip. This strip is pushed under the small of the patient's back and pulled through until equal lengths appear on each side of the patient's body. Using the extended ends of the fabric, pull the strip of fabric down so that it's behind the injured pelvis and cross the ends in front of the pelvis. Twist the ends together so that the fabric is tightly secured around the pelvis. Tuck the leftover fabric ends under the patient or tie them into a knot. The patient should then be placed on a long backboard. Use a blanket or a pillow for padding between the patient's legs and add padding on both sides of the patient's hips. Then, secure the patient to the backboard. Minimize movement of the pelvis and legs. The hip is the joint where the thigh bone or femur fits into the pelvis. Like the pelvis, the femur has significant blood vessels and any injury to this area can cause dangerous bleeding which can be difficult to detect. Look for swelling in the thigh area. Assess and treat for bleeding and shock before beginning to splint. To immobilize the hip, you will need to splint the patient's entire body on a long backboard. As mentioned before, injuries to the femur can be very serious because of the risk of bleeding, which may be internal and not noticed. A broken femur causes a great deal of pain and significant swelling. The deformity of the thigh is usually quite noticeable, and the muscle often contracts, meaning shortening, with this type of break. The leg may also be turned inward or outward. Use a traction splint if one's available, and if you've had training to apply this type of splint correctly. If a traction splint cannot be applied, you can use two long rigid splints instead with padding to fill any gaps between the splint and the patient's body. One splint or board must start at the patient's groin area and extend past the bottom of the patient's foot on the inside of the affected leg. The other should go from the patient's armpit to below the bottom of the patient's foot. Wrap the boards tightly using cravats at the chest, hips, knees, and ankles to immobilize the body. Knees may be injured in either bent or straight position. Do not attempt to change the position of the knee. If it's straight, use two padded rigid splints, one on the outside and one on the inside of the leg. The inside splint should start at the groin and extend past the bottom of the foot. The outside splint should start at the hip and also extend past the foot. Use cravats to keep the splints in place. If the knee is bent, use a pillow or folded blanket under the knee to maintain the bent position. Then use short, padded, rigid splints running along either side of the knee to immobilize the upper and lower leg in relationship to the knee. The tibia, known as the shin bone, and fibula are the two bones that extend from the knee to the ankle. The tibia is covered by only a thin layer of skin, so open fractures of this bone are common. The fibula is not a weight-bearing bone, and fractures of this bone may not be as easily detected. Injuries to either bone are splinted in the same way, using a circumferential air splint, extending from above the knee to below the foot. Or you can use two padded rigid splints, one on the inside running from the groin to below the foot, and the other on the outside running from the hip to below the foot. Injuries to the foot or ankle are often caused by heavy objects falling on the foot or when a falling person lands on the feet. Twisting forces during a fall or while running can also cause an ankle injury. Whether the injury is a break or a sprain, both should be splinted in the same way, by immobilizing the entire foot and ankle. A circumferential air splint is a good choice, but a pillow or a thick blanket wrapped around the foot and ankle and secured in place will also work. Injuries to bones, muscles, and joints are generally caused by significant force, so careful assessment should be done to identify or rule out other injuries. Injuries can include fractures to bones, dislocations of joints, and strains and sprains involving muscles, ligaments, and tendons. It is not always easy to identify the type of injury present. Injuries to the pelvis or femur are potentially critical because of the major blood vessels running through these parts of the body. Assess the patient for bleeding and shock. Ensure that the patient is breathing effectively and provide emergency oxygen if needed. Assess for bleeding and take steps to control bleeding if necessary. If a spinal injury is suspected, stabilize the spine and keep the patient flat. Avoid any movements or changes in position that cause pain. Help the patient find the most comfortable position. Remove any jewelry or restrictive clothing in the affected area. Clean and bandage any open wounds before splinting. Follow guidelines to immobilize the injured joint or bones with splints. Check the patient's pulse and ability to move and detect touch in the injured parts before and after splinting. 
Apply ice or a cold pack to reduce swelling and ease pain and discomfort. If there is no spinal injury and the limb has been securely immobilized, elevate it so that it is above the level of the patient's heart. In most cases, splinting the injured area will help prevent further damage, reduce bleeding, and reduce pain. A variety of commercial splints are available for this purpose. Many splints can be improvised if commercial splints are not available. After splinting, check every 15 minutes to see that a patient's pulse, ability to move, skin temperature, color, and ability to detect touch in the part of the body past the injured area are still stable. So that's going to wrap it up for Chapter 22, Injuries to Muscles, Bones, and Joints. Oh, but wait, no it doesn't. We also in this chapter have four additional skills and two additional enrichments. We have applying a rigid splint, applying a sling and binder, applying an anatomic splint, and splinting the soft splint. And then for enrichment, we have handling of the agricultural emergency as well as handling of the industrial emergency. So be sure you check those out. As always, if you have any questions, then drop a comment or send a message. Thank you so much again for spending your time to learn about injuries to the muscles, bones, and joints. As always, be good people and do good things. And we'll see you next time. Bye.